Good morning. I am, my name is John Lajere. I am the founder and CEO of Access and the 2020 DRC board chair. Welcome to the special address from our governor, Greg Abbott. And I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, Toyota Motor North America, for making today's event possible. It's been a true honor to serve as a DRC board chair for the past 11 months. And I am very proud of the work that we've accomplished during this unprecedented time. This year has been like no other year and surely one that we will not forget. But the point is that's really important is that we've all grown in many ways this year. And I am particularly very proud of how the DRC has pivoted and continue to lead important initiatives for this region in a time of crisis. We know none of this work is possible without the collaboration of our public officials. So today we have the honor of hearing from our governor, Greg Abbott. As a 40th governor of the state of Texas, Greg Abbott continues to be a leader who fights for, to preserve Texas's values such as faith, family, and freedom. Under Governor Abbott's strong leadership, his commitment to economic freedom and opportunity, and his careful stewardship of the 10th largest economy in the world, Texas continues to be the best place, the best state to live, work, and raise a family. Governor, I would like to congratulate you on winning the Governor's Cup for a record-breaking eighth year in a row and for the 16th year overall, more than any other state. And this is a testament to your continued leadership and support of programs that expand economic opportunity in the Lone Star State. Your partnership with local, regional, and statewide economic development entities, including the DRC's economic development team, helps the Dallas region continue to be an economic engine for the entire state. And your focus, especially this year, on keeping Texans safe and healthy during this pandemic will position our great state to come out of this challenging year and challenging time even a lot stronger. So for those of you who may not be aware, I wanna share a bit about the governor's background. Before his election in 2014, Governor Abbott was the 50th and longest serving attorney general of Texas. He also previously served as a justice on the Texas Supreme Court and as a state district judge in Harris County. Governor Abbott was born in Wichita Falls and raised right here in our region, in Duncanville. And he is, as he has said um, countless times publicly, he is a, is a strong supporter of our region. And in addition to all that, he's an avid sportsman and hunter. After graduating from the University of Texas at Austin, Governor Abbott earned a, a law degree from Vanderbilt University Law School. Governor Abbott and his wife, Cecilia, a former teacher and principal, and the first Hispanic first lady of Texas married in 1981. Their daughter, Audrey, is a college student. Today, I am honored to welcome the governor of our great state of Texas, Greg Abbott. Governor? Thank you very much for those very kind words. It's great to be back with the DRC again, uh, a you know, national, if not international leader uh, in what you do. And, and candidly, much of the economic success that Texas has enjoyed has been as a result of all that DRC does. So as governor, I wanna make sure you know the gratitude that I and the state of Texas have for everything that you do. We're so proud of what's going on economically, but before I get to that, I wanna give you just a very quick update on what's going on in response to COVID-19. Uh, I, I know that uh, you all were uh, among the first, if not the very first in the state of Texas to receive the vaccines. Uh, this is something that will just continue to increase. Uh, the way this works is uh, we receive daily supplies of these vaccines. Uh, they are allocated on a weekly basis. Uh, the weekly allocations are just going to continue to increase as we go forward. Right now, the only vaccines that we are receiving are the vaccines that are manufactured by Pfizer. We do expect later this week, uh, the vaccine manufactured by Moderna to get emergency use authorization and they will be added to the allocations that we will be receiving uh, beginning next week. And so by the end of this month, just by the end of December, we are expecting to uh, vaccinate uh, more Texans 
than the total number of Texans who have uh, tested positive for COVID-19 from the very beginning of this uh, pandemic. And so we are on a pathway to recovery. And then the amount of vaccines that will be distributed uh, in January and February should uh, equal about 10 percent of the, of the Texas population each and every month. And so uh, mathematically, we're going to get to the point where all we're going to see are, are daily declines in the number of people testing positive, declines in the number of people hospitalized, and declines in fatalities. Now, I know right now, the Dallas and Fort Worth regions may be the hardest hit in our state. But remember this, it was just two or three or four weeks ago that El Paso was the hardest hit and they faced enormous challenges. And pretty much at the same time, Lubbock was going through the same level of challenge. Uh, but because of the way that people responded to those challenges, uh, now Lubbock and El Paso are in great decline and reduction in COVID cases and hospitalizations and fatalities. And that's exactly where Dallas and Fort Worth will be here uh, in the coming weeks. All of this process will be accelerated by two things. One that we talked about, and that is the increase in vaccines. A second, however, is something that I really wanna emphasize with you all so you can make sure that you're working with your local officials on what I'm about to talk about. I just returned last night from a trip to Washington DC where among other things I met in the Situation Room with uh, the Vice President, uh, Dr. Redfield, who's in charge of the CDC, uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, as well as the Administrator for uh, Medicaid. And they all talked about and emphasized one point for all states that we need to uh, accelerate the process of, and that is the process of getting to the public these antibody therapeutic drugs. Uh, these are the drugs made by Regeneron, and Eli Lilly. Uh, there are tens of thousands of those that are currently available in the state of Texas that are not being utilized. Uh, these are drugs like the one that the president took after he got COVID-19 and he quickly overcame it. I know people in the Dallas-Fort Worth area personally who have received these uh, antibody therapeutic drugs and after getting them they said they had never felt better and they lead to quick recoveries. And so our goal is to keep people out of hospitals and put them on the pathway to, to recovery. One way to do that is through these vaccines. Another way to do that is through these antibody therapeutics. And so we really need to encourage uh, the greater adoption and usage of these antibody therapeutic drugs. And maybe the more you can convey that to the hospital leaders in your region, all the better. But because when you put all of these medical advancements to, uh, to work in combination, one thing that I fully expect to see, and that is a very uh, swift escalation of our economy in the state of Texas. And I would say as, as soon as in January, definitely by February. But candidly, you are already seeing some results of it. Uh, you're seeing all these businesses relocate to regions in Texas, especially in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, you've seen headlines perhaps last week about Oracle moving its headquarters to Austin, Texas. And you may remember the news about Tesla moving to Austin, but uh, also you're familiar with the fact that next month should be the grand opening of the new headquarters for Charles Schwab up there in the Dallas area. Uh, you already uh, know about CBRE, Fortune 500 real estate company moving its headquarters to Dallas, Texas last month. And as you may know about future potential announcements coming to your region, uh, there is a, a massive relocation uh, of large segments of the financial industry uh, that will be involved in announcements that will be made uh, in the coming months, if not coming weeks, about what is happening in the Dallas area. So this is candidly a very exciting time as it concerns economic development. It's gonna be a prolific year next year with new projects. We have more than 200 projects in our pipeline right now as we speak today. Uh, that we are ready to capitalize on uh, in the coming weeks and uh, definitely next year. Uh, as was pointed out in the introduction every year that I've been governor, we've won the, the Governor's Cup for the most new corporate relocations. And I fully expect both this year and next year to be the best years yet. So the best is yet to come. It's gonna be as a result of the state of Texas working in collaboration with DRC and your leadership uh, to make sure that we continue to attract the very best to our region, as well as to assist the businesses that are already there, grow and expand and get people back to work. 
So with that, I'm more than happy to pass it off to the questions you may have. If, if not, I can give you another hour monologue if you prefer. <laughs> Governor Abbott, thank you. Thank you so much for your um, remarks. Um, so we have some questions for you. And um, Governor, you, you are psychic because um, you know what's on our minds. The vaccine is top of mind for everyone. So we, we're glad that you kicked us off talking about that. So, so tell us, how does the state plan to educate the public on why it's important to get vaccinated and that more than one dose is necessary, especially within a specific time frame, and that why being vaccinated doesn't mean you still cannot spread the virus. Please talk to us about that. So we, we have the, the good fortune of, of working in collaboration with the White House Coronavirus Team, and we actually began on the process of the questions you just asked uh, back in the spring and we perfected it uh, over the course of the fall, uh, ready to execute it. Some easy examples, and that is uh, anytime anybody in the public goes uh, and receives one of these vaccines, uh, they'll be receiving a card providing them notification about making sure they get the second vaccine. And then in addition to that, we will be providing text messages, email messages, phone calls, as well as uh, public announcements talking about both the necessity of getting a vaccine as well as the necessity of getting the second shot, uh, knowing that one shot will help, but one shot will not complete uh, what you need in order to make sure that you do develop the immunity that you need to make sure you do not get uh, COVID-19. And so uh, we, we have carefully organized plans to achieve all of those goals that you were talking about. And we even uh, test modeled uh, all of these by doing mock distribution plans to make sure we would be able to do it flawlessly. And everything that I've seen so far over the past uh, 48 hours is everything has gone exactly as planned. So as you probably know, first we do the uh, frontline healthcare workers, and then we uh, are working uh, to have massive distributions uh, in the nursing home facilities. And there's a reason for that. And that's because uh, you see the, the largest number of people who are hospitalized, as well as the largest number of people who lose their lives because of COVID uh, are the senior population, especially those in nursing home settings. And goal number one uh, is to make sure that we do all we can uh, to preserve life, to prevent the loss of life. And the best way to do that is to first approach the population groups uh, that are most likely to lose their lives. And those are the people in nursing homes as well as our senior population. Hey, Governor Abba, thank you so much for that. You know, in your opening comments, you, you touched on the economy as well. So let's dive deeper into that. So, so tell us, how important is it for the state to invest in workforce development um, to recover from the economic impacts of the pandemic um, in relation to health concerns, um, struggling sectors like the air travel industry is still struggling or all the um, in relation to new public infrastructure needs and maintenance and just other key inputs for a healthy economy overall. So I'm, I'm gonna give you several different approaches to answer your question. So for one, workforce development is always important. I just got off a phone call last week about a business that wants to uh, locate in, in an area very near Dallas. And a key aspect of it was to make sure that we were going to be able to provide the workforce development that this unique business needed. And we explained exactly how we could do that. That said, I, I can tell you that a, a first and foremost issue uh, this coming session is going to be on workforce development because one of our top shelf issues uh, is to make sure that we get people uh, back to work as quickly as possible. For, for the airline industry, the, the main thing about the airline industry uh, is just for the economies to be able to open up. And the premier way that we are going to enable the economies to open up is by being very successful in the vaccines. Once It's, it's kind of hard to believe because we've been, we've been in this situation where we haven't had any medical defense to COVID for the past nine months. But when, when people get the COVID-19 vaccine, when they realize that they now can go to restaurants, they can fly on a plane, et cetera, without having to fear contracting COVID-19, uh, that's when you will begin to see the airlines really begin to take off, no pun intended. Uh, but I realized both Southwest and American are headquartered there in the Dallas area. And the, the future for them uh, looks very, very bright. I do wanna, however, add something that you may not think about uh, as being a hugely important issue. But I talk to CEOs every single week. CEOs who have come here, CEOs who want to come here, and they talk to me about reasons why they are fleeing 
their current states. It could be California, it could be New York, it could be Illinois. Uh, it could be examples of what's going on in places like Portland and Seattle. You, you need to understand that a company has their own ability uh, to do some level of workforce training. They have their own ability to structure their company in ways in which they can succeed. There are certain things that are important to businesses that they cannot provide. One is a safe community. And so one of the things that we as a state and you as a community need to focus on is making sure that we do all we can to provide that safe community. That is something that businesses are not capable of doing on their own. And hence, these efforts that you see to defund the police, they need to be debunked, they need to be stopped. Now, I know that your mayor stands strongly in favor of making sure that we fund police and have good qualified workforce on the streets, keeping the streets of the Dallas area as safe as possible. We need to make sure that we continue to make that happen. Another issue that I hear directly from the CEOs who are trying to flee San Francisco and these other places is we must step up and address the homeless situation. We could call it a homeless crisis. Now, it is far more prolific in Austin than it is in the Dallas region, for example, but uh, we know that if not addressed, it can escalate in the Dallas region. Part of the solution deals with compassion. Part of the solution deals with uh, a facility that you already have up there that provides uh, solutions and answers and help for the homeless. But part of the solution ensures uh, that we don't have Dallas or other cities do what Austin did, uh, and that is to lift uh, the ban on camping by the homeless. Uh, that has uh, really escalated the problem in the Austin area. And candidly, I, I get comments from CEOs across uh, the globe saying that they are choosing now not to relocate to Austin, Texas, in part because of their homeless problem. And we cannot allow similar results to happen to the Dallas area. So one thing that you will see that I will be offering up as legislation this session is, uh, one, uh, a ban on homeless camping coupled with uh, providing assistance and support for those who are homeless. Uh, but second, uh, a prohibition on defunding police, knowing that our police play a critical role in keeping our community safe. Wow, excellent, excellent um, comments. Governor, thank you so much for working very hard for us. We, we, we certainly appreciate that. Well, you've said this countless times that government alone cannot do all this work. So tell us, um, um, we, we, want, we want citizens to support. So what one or two or maybe three things can the average citizen of Texas do as an individual to support all your hard work and all your efforts to bring Texas out of the current series of crisis, whether it's, uh, you talked about COVID and um, safe um, communities, homeless issues. So what can we do as citizens to get us out of this current crisis faster than any other state or, or global region? How can we support you better? So for one, as it concerns COVID, for example, everybody in the state of Texas, every adult in the state of Texas now knows exactly what is needed to respond to COVID in a way that contains it until we have uh, more broad spread vaccines, uh, and that is just use the safe practices. Uh, we are seeing a spike in cases in the Dallas area, and I think uh, that could be in the aftermath of Thanksgiving. And if, if people don't follow safe practices over the Christmas time, we could see another spike occur then. That how, after those time periods, however, I do believe that we will see COVID get uh, increasingly contained because we now have the solution to COVID that is the solution. Uh, and that is the medical solution, whether it be uh, the vaccines or the antibody therapeutics. Remember, COVID is a virus. Flu is a virus. The reason why the common flu doesn't pose the same challenges as COVID is because we already have medical uh, vaccines as well as treatments for the common flu. And, and now we have similar medical treatments and vaccines for COVID. And hence, uh, beginning in a month or two, COVID will pose no more serious problem uh, than the common flu. But we need everybody in the meantime to cooperate and collaborate in that process of helping us continue to contain the spread of COVID uh, as we work to uh, get it under control by vaccines and then be prepared to go back to work. And it, mark, mark my words, uh, you'll see this uh, by mid to late February. You'll say, you know, the governor was right all along. And that is, you, you will see a dramatic increase in business activity. I give you a foreshadowing of this. During November, 
uh, at a time when there, there were no medical capabilities of dealing with COVID. You saw people getting out, wanting to go to bars, to restaurants, to travel, et cetera. Uh, if, if these people know in full well they had zero capability of, of preventing the spread of COVID medically, uh, if they're engaging in activity at that time, when they do have the medical treatments available to them to contain COVID, you will see that they will fully and swiftly re-engage economically. And so what, what I would tell you all uh, is you all need to be prepared. You, you need to have your, your checklist made uh, ab about what you wanna do for economic development purposes and be ready to go uh, knowing that it's gonna happen very swiftly. It's a, it, you may have some, some football fans. I, I think Tom Landry used to do this uh, for the Dallas Cowboys. You still see some coaches do this. Uh, they have a, a card made up in advance about what play they're going to call for the first 20 plays of the game that they're going to stick to uh, regardless. And that's exactly what you all need to be doing right now. You need a play card uh, ready and prepared uh, when 2021 begins about what you want to do to execute on your game plan for economic development in the Dallas region and then tick them off because it's going to happen that fast once 2021 gets here. Got it. Governor, we know you're very busy, so thank you so much for your time today. Um, you've got a lot on your plate, but you made time for us. We're grateful. This was an incredibly helpful and timely conversation. Now I would like to, to welcome our presenting sponsor, Toyota Motor North America, for some closing remarks. Chris? Governor Abbott, thank you very much for your remarks and for sharing your insights and the really promising outlook of how we will overcome COVID-19 in our great state as well as your responses on economic development, workforce development uh, is, as well. But more importantly, I'd like to thank you for your leadership. We are so fortunate to have a strong leader and dedicated public servant at the helm of our great state. It's amazing to think, Governor, how much the world has changed since you helped Toyota open its North American headquarters in 2017. And the two of us were together in Japan just a little over a year ago. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Chris Nielsen, Executive Vice President of Toyota Motor North America, as well as, as being very privileged to be the 2019 DRC Board Chair. Governor, as you know, Toyota directly and indirectly employs over 20,000 people in the great state of Texas. Through our manufacturing plant in San Antonio, our North American headquarters, and many suppliers and dealers throughout the state. We recognized early on that Texas offers the competitive business climate and available skilled workforce that Toyota needs to thrive. And we're encouraged to see so many others following our lead, especially recently, as you noted. Companies who are eager to become a part of the fabric of Texas, dig in their boots, and join all of us in ensuring the Texas miracle continues. Governor, Texas's job-ready workforce continues to serve as a backbone of the Texas economy. Toyota will always do its part in contributing to its growth. And I'd like to commend you on the establishment of the Tri-Agency Workforce Initiative, assessing local economic activity, examining workforce challenges and opportunities, and introducing innovative approaches to meeting the state's workforce goals. It's this collaboration that will ensure that Texas schools are producing students with the skills and mindset to meet the job demands of the future. For example, Toyota is a strong advocate for a program known as FAME, Federation for Advanced Manufacturing Education. Now we created this program in 2010 to meet a growing need in the manufacturing employment pipeline. As technology increases, so does the need for highly skilled technicians. It's now the nation's premier manufacturing education program for training students seeking careers in manufacturing and upskilling existing team members and veterans as well. By teaching technical skills, building professional habits, and instilling industry-specific culture and knowledge. And Toyota is doing its part to expand the program. Just last year, we announced a partnership, the transition operation and stewardship of the program to the Manufacturing Institute, the workforce and education arm of the National Association of Manufacturers. Now this will allow the program to move beyond the auto industry and into every state. And I'm proud to note that this program is expanding 
across Texas, including here in the, in the Metroplex. Additionally, Texas's business-friendly and low-regulation environment is not by chance. It's the collective work of, of leaders like, like you, Governor Abbott, as well as our North Texas area delegation of state representatives and senators who support the principles of free enterprise. Now we are just 32 days from the start of the 87th state legislative session. And this will be one of the toughest sessions in recent history as our legislators convene during a pandemic and a challenging business or budget environment. The North Texas delegation will be meeting virtually beginning right after this session to hear from leading DRC members on key priorities for the business community. These range from reauthorizing economic incentive programs to expanding broadband access across the state. And these efforts ensure that Texas remains the leading state for business and helps keep the North Texas region the best place for all people to live, work, and do business. Governor, we look forward to supporting you and your team throughout the session. Again, thank you for being with us.